So, Asha, was this a good week for Donald Trump? Yeah, it's complicated. I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So, Asha, we're doing an emergency first section of our podcast today because we've had some insane legal news. Not just did we have the Supreme Court decision, which we kind of expected, but we also have the um, the report of Special Counsel Robert Hur. I don't think either uh, of us saw that coming on the exact same day as the Supreme Court argument. Well, I might have been on standby for the news. So <laughs> I, I, I thought it might come by this week. But yeah, it's just it's been a lot happening this week. I'm in Miami right now. I was on in wow. the air all day. I was listening to this oral argument at Hartford Bradley Airport trying to squeeze it in before my plane took off. Um, and now I'm here and now we're recording and I'm in a hotel room, which is why my background is kind of. Well, since you've been listening to the oral argument, let's start there. Um, I, I think it was pretty obvious that the vast majority of the justices are going to side with Donald Trump and, and against the Colorado Supreme court. Were you surprised by that at all? You know, I just was really surprised that even the more liberal justices were frankly trying to help Trump's lawyer, I think, articulate his case more clearly. Um, you know, sort of, I mean, you had Justice Jackson being like, I don't know why you're not arguing X. Like, she just kept trying to like make this like very direct argument for him. Um, and then you, you know, you basically had all of the justices, I think, kind of, uh, trying to elucidate his opinion, his, his argument, I think, to tease it out. And I think the challenger argument who representing Colorado, uh, kind of just missed the boat. I, I, I don't know. Listen, I, look, I'm not going to. I'm not going to criticize oral or like advocates because it's very difficult. And I know that arguing in front of the Supreme court, I'm sure is really scary and intimidating, but I have to say that it did not seem that they went in like aggressively. And I think they, they were not, they were not listen They were not hearing where the court was in terms of, addressing their argument. That was my takeaway. Well, lots to unpack there. Let me, I'll start with this oral, <clears throat> the oral advocate point. I mean, one thing I will say, I am more bullish about the performance of Trump's lawyer maybe than you were in that I'm mean, Jonathan Mitchell. I know Jonathan Mitchell. I've known him for some time. Um, he's, he's probably the best lawyer that Trump has by good margin. Um, very, you know, he's done some things that are, I mean, incredibly, um, horrible, uh, I think, uh, like that Texas law that he concocted to um, essentially have people suing healthcare providers to, to you the know. The vigilante to, bill, kind of. Yes. The vigilante was, abortion bill. Yeah. Yes, that was his brainchild. But he's he's very intelligent and very capable. I thought he did a good job overall. Obviously, as you point out, aided by the fact that at least seven or eight of the justices were on his team, I think, from the very start. Um, but I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, I thought that uh, about the other advocates, I mean, I think, you know, the, the advocate for the people who were, um, the, um, you know, the respondents in this case who had brought the suit originally, you know, he, that lawyer, you know, I agree that, you know, he was, uh, he had a uphill battle. I mean, it's essentially, it's like those people, uh, who have to hit the half court shot at, at the NBA game to get a million dollars, you know, or a three quarters shot. Like every, everyone knows it's not going to go in. I mean, I think it was a tough uphill battle, but he was not ready for that uh, battle at all. And I think, 
Um, he, he was very unprepared and at times made arguments that actually hurt his own position. They're very bizarre head scratcher arguments. And I think, you know, he's a Supreme Court clerk and an accomplished guy. And when you are there for the most important argument of your career, you have to be ready for it. Um, and I thought the lawyer for Colorado, um, the third lawyer who, who argued, you know, she just, what, what I thought, I mean, she did a, a better job in a certain sense, but really the issue there is, and this happens all the time, Asha trials. Like I've been, I've been the lawyer on the other side of watching my opponents do this is you're heading, they're heading towards the Titanic or they're towards an iceberg. And they're not like steering the Titanic anywhere else. They're just going to steer right into the iceberg. They're going to go with the plan that they had going in. So she was there like talking about Colorado, whatever. And it had nothing to do with anything. Like she wasn't trying to win the argument. Like she didn't realize like, here's where things are going. They're go, we're going against us. We need to do something to change it up. Like she just was not capable of that or not able to do it. Correct. I, I feel like they went in wanting to talk about whether or not Trump engaged in in insurrection. And the court really wasn't interested in in getting into the meat of whether Trump engaged in insurrection. They were more focused on, I think, whether Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was self-executing. And on this front, this this was a lot of what Trump's lawyer focused on and what the questions were directed at. And he was relying on a case, not a Supreme Court case, a circuit court case called Drif- Griffin's case, which which I understood to be uh, a, a case shortly after the amendment was passed where a prisoner raised a habeas challenge, meaning that he was claiming that he was being unlawfully detained, and his basis for claiming that was that the judge who adjudicated his case was an insurrectionist and had not, and and was disqualified from hearing his case, basically. And I think the dilemma that was presented to the judge at that time was, well, if we agree with him, like he wasn't an insurrectionist, but if we were to agree with him that he's de facto disqualified, then everything this judge has done while sitting as a judge would then be invalid. And so that was like kind of one argument. So, and and then as a result of that, Congress passed some law. So this Trump's lawyer's argument was that shows us that the understanding of section three of the 14th amendment is that Congress has to provide enacting legislation for this to go into effect. And whatever legislation that was, was repealed later on for reasons that are not clear, um, that which is why that's not in effect today. But what he's arguing is, therefore, Trump cannot be disqualified unless Congress does something that, you know, creates a procedure or some criteria or something like that that allows him to be um, disqualified. The only thing that they have passed so far is the criminal uh, code 23, 18 USC 2383, which is rebellion and insurrection, which makes insurrection a crime, uh, which he hasn't been charged with. So that was like one whole thing that they focused a lot of time on and which the Colorado lawyers, I don't even think addressed. That's right. They didn't see where, th- where things are going. This happens, like I said, at trial all the time. You see where the fault line is at the trial and you don't change your theory and change your evidence and change your plan to, to address that. And so I think it was a huge problem. Um, and, you know, I did see some analysts saying essentially their view was, and like Steve Vladek has been on our podcast talking about how he actually viewed at the end, he thinks that it's going to be a very narrow decision. It won't even, you know, be down to whether it's, you know, won't even have self executed yeah, execution as the core, but regardless, I mean, I guess my reaction to the, my general reaction to this oral argument was that I really think, Asha, if you had chat GPT looking at the text and the, in the, um, uh, legislative history, they might come out, come out differently, but we didn't have chat GPT doing this. We didn't have nine chat GPTs. We had human beings. And I really think what was motivating the justices were what I would call prudential concerns. And how is this going to be when we have, what if we have different states? 
coming to different results and how is this going to be and where is this going to leave the court? Where is this going to leave our democracy? I felt like that was what was driving the decision, which is fascinating, of course, because a lot of times folks on the right are the ones telling us that, oh, no, you just need to look at the text and sit there and look at old dictionaries and or something. And let the chips and that's fall gonna, where they may. Yeah. Yes. Let the chips fall. Oh, it turns out that like guns, you know, or, or the gun regulation is this way or abortions that way up. You know, that's just what they thought back in 1789. Uh, but but here, um, you know, obviously they were they were focused on these other concerns. Yeah. The irony here is really the narrowest way for the court to deal with this would be to just engage with the question, with the facts of this particular case. Did Trump engage in an insurrection? Yes or no? If he did, done. If not, not. You know, in, in other words, then you don't have to make these big constitutional pronouncements about, uh, you know, whether it's self-executing. And another big issue that was being raised, and this was the one that was being pushed by Justice Jackson, and I'm really concerned that this might be where the court goes. I really hope not, because I think it would be a very, you know, momentous pronouncement, was whether it even applies to the president. And yeah, I don't think they're going the, there. Yeah, it, but it was just, it, I was really surprised that she was really focused on that. And I saw an op-ed by Rick Hayson, who's an election lawyer, who said that she she was offering an off ramp, like kind of a a way for the court to come together. And I was like, that would be totally awful for the court to pronounce that this section of the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to the president, because then you're just giving a green light for anyone who uh, occupies the office that they can like coup without repercussion. I, I this doesn't. I was really shocked. I saw, yeah, I saw his op-ed and then I saw um, the a former acting solicitor general, you know, cite it as something worth reading. And I was like, well, that, if this is where the court goes, then this would really suck. And, you know, it was parsing the whole language of the, of section three, whether he's an officer, you know, um, at, at, as the, language says. And I thought what was really interesting is that Trump's lawyer's construction under that argument would basically only exempt Trump. I didn't realize that. That under their construction, literally of every president that has ever held the presidency, the only person to whom Section 3 would not apply is Trump because not only was he president, but he never held an office before where he took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, which seems really cuckoo pants to me. Yeah, it was a very, well, it's trying to come up with the most narrow way of getting right, getting, giving the court an off ramp. I mean, I thought it was very crass. I mean, one thing I will just say is Jonathan Mitchell did, was very upfront about what he's trying to do, right? I mean, it's like, hey, here's our argument. Here's why. If I argued this, then it would get, the, I mean, he was just telling the justices, like, here's how to get from point A to point B. And I think he correctly read that that's what the justices were looking for. He's like, if we do this, like it would help, it would be a problem for us if we, if that, cause there'd be this argument is so we have to like carefully construct. He was basically telling the justices how to get from point A to point B because he correctly read that that's what the justices were looking for. And it was his job to come up with a pathway for them. And, and what Steve Vladek was saying is he thought the pathway was going to be something like the, basically all the court was going to do is say the states have no role in this. This has got to be a federal thing. And then that would leave, I don't, I don't know exactly what points in the argument he got that. He pulled that out. But if that was the case, that would leave open the possibility that Congress could then, you know, on January 6th of uh, 2020, 2025, make a decision that, hey, we're the newly elected Congress. We think he's an insurrectionist, you know. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what to make of that. But I, I will just say that, generally speaking, it's very obvious where this is going to go. And I think the Supreme Court has made a decision that they – do not want Trump disqualified and they as an institution in the Supreme Court really don't want to be seen as have any has having anything to do with it. Yeah. With it. So to your first point about Trump's lawyer, I do think he was offering a lot of concessions. I mean, he 
which I think is powerful. You know, when I teach my national security law class, I have my students write papers each week where they have to make an argument based on, you know, a prompt that I give them. And I tell them they always have to address the counter argument. They have to take the other side seriously and address a weakness in their argument because that then strengthens their own position when you do that and when you rebut it in a way, when you address it. I thought he was really good about that. And I think it he he would like they would He's say, Well, why that. aren't you arguing this? And he would say, Well, the historical evidence cuts both ways. So we just don't think that that's really where we want to hang our hat. You know, we this we do take the position of X, but that's not where we want to put all of our eggs because the other side, they would he was literally saying the other side will say this, and then you know it it makes it hard for us to respond. And I, I do think that that created a lot of credibility, I guess, for his argument, like you said, and I, I didn't think of it in the way that you did, that he it, he was really helping the justices navigate how to thread this needle. And he, un, like, he understood the assignment. And I think the Colorado lawyers didn't quite understand the assignment or, or weren't, didn't change course when the assignment changed at the oral argument. Yeah, and I have to say it's very odd that they weren't prepared for that because I think you know you and I, Ash, have talked about this case before on this podcast. If you're if you're somebody who's been listening to this podcast, you know that Ash and I have discussed this, and I said, and I believe you also had the same opinion, Asha, that the way this was going to come out, I think we both thought is that the majority of the justices in the Supreme Court were going to try to, you know, keep Trump in the ballot on very narrow ground. I whether it was. Um, self-execution or political question or what, right? There was going to be some way that they were going to get there. And so I just don't know how you couldn't anticipate that if you're um, on the other side. Yeah. So I think, so one of the arguments that Trump's lawyer made was that you can't disqualify Trump I guess this is based on, let's assume that he's an insurrectionist. Even if he's an insurrectionist, you couldn't disqualify him because there's a way for him to be relieved of that disability under that same amendment. That Congress can take that disability away by a two-thirds vote. And therefore, it would be premature to disqualify him when he basically has until, I guess, you know, the the day that of the electoral vote uh, or electoral count certification to be relieved of that disqualification and one thing that i was just really surprised about is that the justices cuz on you know on the one hand you kind of it's like jedi mind trick you're like huh okay i guess that's true i guess that's what makes it sort of different than like whether you're a natural born citizen or you know whether you're whatever, the 35. Um, but on the other hand, it's sort of like, well, then doesn't that just kick the can down the road? Because what if he is by definition disqualified and Congress doesn't lift the disability and he gets elected, then what do you do? Like, how do you, do you not allow him to assume office? Like what happens then? And it's a little bit so it's similar to what you just said that if you if you kick the can if you put the burden on congress in any way you're just kicking the can down the road to some degree i i mean i don't see how that really resolves the question which is why i think that the only really the only way they could have really dealt with this was to put on their big boy pants and just answer the question but they didn't. Yeah, I think they may, but I think they just may be making a very um, practical calculus of what they think will happen and so on. I think what really is animating the justices is a couple things. One is they're very concerned about, and you could hear this from some of the justices, about having different states, having different opinions of whether someone engaged in an insurrection and using it as a political weapon to keep people off the ballot. And I think there was also a concern about having the court being the one to make the, a determination um, of that ultimately in the end. They did not want to be in the business of doing it. And that's what this, that's what animated the decision. 
And that's why we have the decision that we do. And ultimately what this means, I think is, you know, it will, you know, it, it, it achieves something that frankly, a lot of elected Democrats also want. And I mean, a lot of elected Democrats kind of came out and said he should be on the ballot. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, whether that's right or good for the country, I, I, I'll reserve judgment on, but one thing I will say is it definitely reveals, um, I'd say the reasoning of the Supreme court, uh, when the chips are down and, and cases that really matter, it's not entirely, you know, a textual, a textual conversation that certainly there was not a lot of sitting there parsing text, um, and history and so forth. Uh, today it was a lot of discussion of those, what I'll call prudential concerns. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I do think that in this regard, this is not unusual for the court. And I, I'm saying this again, when I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm teaching in my national security law class, we just read a, a case from the civil war called the prize cases, which is where like the president's major defensive war powers is kind of like it's, it's a big case that continues on to this day, but it's a five, four decision. And you can see the court like grappling with these idea with this thing, with the reality that the civil war is going on and they need to give Lincoln this power. And they don't want to acknowledge that, you know, the Confederacy is a legitimate adversary in the same way as a nation state. So they're trying to like thread this needle in all these different ways. And it's kind of weird. And it's just a good illustration of, how the court has to take the reality of the situation into account. I personally think that, again, they could have done this more directly. There would have been major consequences and major repercussions. Um, but I have to wonder whether if they are able to achieve some sort of consensus on this particular issue, it means that they will knock down or at least, uh, not take the absolute immunity argument. You know what I mean? Because that that would that that seems like a good like at, not a good. It, it seems like it would at least be an appropriate balance. Like we're gonna tell this guy he has to go and get go to trial like any other person. Sure. I mean, I I thought. I mean, but, to, to the next the segment that where we talk about that in this episode, we recorded before this argument, and I made the same prediction even then. So I always thought that's where this was going to end up, with the Supreme Court not taking the immunity case. And I so and I still think that's the case. But yes, I do think the court is concerned about being perceived as having a political role, and so this is consistent. If they have a nine zero decision or per curiam decision here that does that. And then they don't take the immunity case. I do think that that will serve that those ends. Yeah. Sotomayor seemed the most skeptical of all of them. So I'm not sure this will be Nino. I think that she may have, cause she, she was really poking holes in some of the Trump's lawyers theories and I think was more skeptical not that I think she was completely on board with Colorado's but um yeah I don't think this is gonna go in Colorado's favor but I, I maybe you and I can take bets on that whether we'll, there'll be a loan holdout yeah I don't know I don't know whether Sonomayor wants to put herself out there as the one center in this case I don't know um but I think the important uh you know bottom line here is that ultimately uh, Donald Trump's going to be on the ballot and um, you know, this, the United States Supreme court um, and state governments are not going to be uh, making this determination. I think this, if we can, if we can be very certain after this oral argument um, that this, this argument in this issue is uh, in the past in the rear view mirror. Yeah. And maybe the best we can hope for is that he'll be on the ballot but as a convicted felon. So, Asha, I, I, one piece of news, at least I thought was surprising today, but I guess you were expecting it with all of your inside info from ABC News, uh, was the report of Robert Herr. Um, and I have to say, I, you know, neither of us, I don't think, have read this 250-something page report. I have skimmed through it. I've read some of it. 
um, you know, read some portions, skimmed some other portions. And I have to say, um, it was really disappointing um, in, in certain respects, kind of how this all came down to me. You know, this was a case where um, I don't think it was even a close call that, you know, Biden was not going to be prosecuted. I don't think anyone expected that Biden was going to be prosecuted for alerting uh, the proper authorities to the fact that he had classified documents. But yet we saw, I think, a 257-page report by Robert Herr that contained references that ended up stealing the headline, which was all about, you know, the headlines all were about, um, you know, the fact that he didn't remember certain details about his um, about his son and his, pre you know, the timing of his vice presidency and so on. And it really felt to me like sort of gratuitous details added to the report um, by Robert Herr. And I really, from my perspective, it it really st stood a stark contrast between, it almost reminded me of James Comey 2.0 versus Robert, Robert Mueller, who took, a, I think, a much more measured approach to a report like this one. How long was he investigating this? Because I just remember that... Mueller was criticized for the length of his investigation. And here he was handed a case where Biden had some documents in his garage and, you know, a drawer in various places, let the authorities know about it and completely voluntarily cooperated with the investigation, no obstruction or anything. And it took him this long to figure out that, hmm, this is not something we're going to prosecute. I mean, it's really very straightforward from my perspective. Um, and I understand you want to look into it because he's the president and he's a sitting president and so forth. But man, um, this level of detail and a lot of this extraneous detail, I mean, I do not believe that the prosecution of Biden turns on his memory. I mean, I don't really think that if, if, Don, if uh, Joe Biden had sharp memory, you're going to indict some guy who found that he had some documents and alerted the authorities to it. I just I don't see that. OK. Let's just be clear here. If Biden had squirreled away documents and kept them in his garage, and when the National Archives found out about it, they knocked on his door, he hid, he hid them or just misdirected them and didn't let them see where they were and, you know, turned over some decoy set of documents to make it seem like he had turned them over and it turned out they were like nuclear secrets. I mean, I don't I, I agree with you. I don't think that his age or the state of his memory would be a bar to prosecuting him. And I think her acknowledges that at some point in the report where he notes the differences between Biden's case and Trump's case. But to me, I feel like this could have been done in like five pages. Yeah, I mean, it may be not five, but I mean, it really seemed to be more like a matter that you dispose of in maybe 20 to 50 some pages. OK, and you would have done this in like three months. And I will say, look, I, I, I know prosecutors involved in the I mean, the, the prosecutors involved in this case. There's some good people working on Robert Hur's team and so on. But I have to say that my read on this is the level of detail and some of this extraneous detail. It really read to me. Sort of like, and it reminded me of Comey, where there's this effort to be like, well, we didn't get someone that was, we didn't prosecute somebody who was uh, on the opposite team. And so we're like trying to include all these extraneous details like, God, this person's not a criminal, but they're really, you know, not perfect in some they're way. They're really and, old. And I can't yeah, he's an old stuff. dude who doesn't remember stuff. I mean, I, I just felt like that's not what a prosecutor is supposed to be doing. And I understand that in the special counsel regs, you write a report. But what a contrast to Robert Mueller. And, you know, a lot of the people listening to our podcast are not happy with Robert Mueller and don't like Robert Mueller and are very critical of Robert Mueller. And I still defend the man and his approach to prosecution. And I will never be critical of a prosecutor who pulls his punches and is very careful and very fair and goes out of his way to be fair to the people he's investigating. And I really think that's what Robert Mueller was. And what a contrast between somebody who went out of his way not to say things that he thought were unfair or unnecessary in his report versus somebody who's including such extraneous details in a report. 
I think deliberate, yeah. you know, whether it's deliberate or I mean, it seems deliberate to me to maybe change the headlines or change the narrative. And just to put a finer point on it, I mean, Mueller's case was a a hundred times more complex. I mean, this was a counterintelligence investigation that had criminal components. It had, a, you know, foreign uh, intelligence officers. It had you know, a number of different people. There were just a lot of moving parts. And I think, like you said, that report, which was not that much longer than hers report, even though it was a hundred times more complex, was very careful not to editorialize. I don't think they made value judgments about any of the people that they interviewed. It was, it was very clinical. I mean, it was very FBI, like, here, here are the observations, you know, in terms of what happened. And um, even when it came to Trump, it was literally here are the facts and you can decide what to do with this because we were following DOJ policy. And we're not going to indict yet. Yeah, it was so careful and so measured. It's one of the finest pieces of prosecutorial writing I've ever seen. Um, and to compare it to this is just it's it's like night and day. I will say that, you know, really, uh, from my perspective, this end result is a product of how Garland made, you know, the decisions that Garland made here, which is, you know, there, he ended up relying on a former colleague of mine, a uh, Republican U.S. attorney, to make this call of whether a special counsel was needed instead of making that call himself. That, you know, my, you know, John Lausch, who I do respect, but made that call here. I'm not sure it was necessary. It's really for appearance purposes more than anything, as far as I could tell. It points Robert Her, who goes on this very long investigation and rolls this out, doesn't do a press conference, doesn't, you know, really trumpet his findings, um, and writes a lot of um, extraneous detail. Just, you know, not, I think, what this case merited, a case in which. You know, uh, the president uh, was careless in having those documents um, where he did and not being on top of that and, you know, keeping them in a drawer or in a garage. I mean, that's certainly um, very highly problematic, but I don't think anyone thinks seriously that that's the sort of thing that we would charge criminally. So, Asha, on Tuesday, we had a decision that I think was very long awaited. Uh, people were getting very antsy waiting for this decision to come. And I think it was worth the wait. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, we can go through the opinion and, and talk about it. I don't know that there's anything necessarily earth shattering in terms of their reasoning, but I think it was very well written and it clearly shows that they took the time to put together something, I think, very solid in terms of addressing all of Trump's arguments. And I think that the fact that it was unanimous may have helped, may have explained why it took them a while. I think they really wanted to incorporate all the different perspectives that came out during the oral argument. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I would, in, in addition to the word solid, which I think is a good word, I think say comprehensive is another word that I would use. I mean, it's 57 pages long. They deal with every argument that Trump had. There's not like something that's missing or something that they just give the back of the hand to. They clearly wanted to pr provide detailed reasoning, refuting every single argument raised by Trump and his team or could be conceivably raised. And as you said, I do think part of what took some time here was getting everyone on board. You have three judges and they did not want to have separate opinions. Uh, I, they, I actually think it's notable. This opinion is not signed by any judge in particular. It's per curiam. And that, what that means, it's an opinion delivered by the court without anyone's name on it. And I actually think that that has more power and more force because it's essentially saying, this is not the opinion of any one person. This is the court's opinion. And I think it was intentionally done that way so that they're, they were speaking with one voice and in an authoritative manner. I agree. And does it help that it's per curiam in terms of asking for a rehearing on Bonk? It seems like the entire 
the entire DC circuit would be even less likely to hear something when a three judge panel that was selected is unanimous. I think the unanimity um, matters for sure. If there if there is a dissenter, that would dramatically increase the chances of of a review on Bonk. But separately, I mean, you're you're asking specifically the fact that it's per curiam. What I took that to mean, I took that to be a signal that the three judges in the panel w- really wanted this to be perceived as a, sort of above partisan bickering or yeah. disagreement. They wanted this to be perceived as an authoritative judicial opinion. And I, and I really think that that is going to potentially you know, impact how the Supreme Court looks at this. I mean, if I'm Chief Justice Roberts – um, I don't want to have a divided Supreme Court on this case. I don't want to have something that's going to show acrimony and lots of sharp attacks on you know between the justices, and that may actually counsel this case never being taken by the Supreme Court. Yeah, it will really be interesting to see what they do with it. Um, we can talk about that maybe at the end, but let's dive in to the opinion. There is some. Um, great language in here about sort of what is at stake um, in terms of Trump's argument. But the court starts off with this jurisdictional argument. And it's interesting because the jurisdictional argument was raised by an amicus. Both of the litigating parties agreed that the appellate court should hear this issue now even before the trial, this is an interlocutory appeal of a district court ruling, which t- generally is disfavored in criminal cases. Um, but uh, the question was whether this essentially encompassed a right that becomes unreviewable if you wait until after trial. And they were looking at other types of rights like this, for example, the you know, the prohibition on double jeopardy or congressional immunity, basically this idea that you that there are some things that give you a right not to be tried. And it it gets into this whole technical thing, but it's really important because how they ruled on that would determine the order in which this happened. And if they were to say, we, we don't have jurisdiction, you just have to proceed with trial, then we could have conceivably been in a situation where Trump goes through the trial, gets convicted, and then this whole issue goes up and blows it all up. That's right. I mean, I think there is uh, an interest uh, in the from the perspective of the public and the nation to have some sort of um, determination on the front end as to whether or not the president's above the law. It's a very important um I think issue, we've talked about this before, Ash, when we were discussing the oral argument, how in many ways, while the arguments, a lot of the arguments that were raised by Trump's team are silly, these are the, some of the most important matters that a court could ever consider, whether the president is very literally above the law, like, can, you know, can he shoot people and, and whatever, rape, pillage, uh, murder, and be above the law. So very important issue. And so I, I and I think the reason that it was it was very prominent in the opinion, even though I'm sure a lot of our listeners are like, like, who cares? Like, why are we discussing this issue is because courts typically try to not stretch to resolve issues unless they're absolutely necessary, because courts are trying to do as little as possible. So it's a little bit of there's a, I wouldn't say gymnastics that are done here, but there's definitely the courts going out of their way to show why it was appropriate for them to consider the issues. I, I was curious if you got that sense too. I, you know, this authoritative case that they're referring to, um, Midland Asphalt, I'm not super familiar with, but it it's sort of at some point they're like, well, anyway, the president is sui generis, which is a term we've used on this podcast before, meaning he's in a class of his own. And so, you know, we can't take this, the, you know, case completely literally. We have to look at sort of the spirit of what it's trying to do. And that, as you just said, the interests here are so weighty, uh, the impact on this institution of the presidency potentially huge that this ought to be something that ought that should be resolved first. That's right. I, I, when I talk to friends of mine who are litigators in in DC, uh, or very you know very familiar with that case law, they were 
um, more uh, they, they were more concerned about Midland Asphalt than I was and about whether or not that issue would end up just sort of resolving the whole thing. I, I just assumed that the court, I may be elite, too much of a legal realist. I assumed the court would find a way to get from point A to point B, and they clearly did. I, I will say I don't think a lot of their other reasoning was that way. Like when you walk through it, partly I think just Trump's arguments are all uphill. I don't, and we've had this discussion before, I don't fault him making them because they're frankly better than the arguments made by 90 something percent of criminal defendants in cases. Uh, but um, they are, um, you know, they, they, are, they were fairly easy, I think, for the court to dispose of. Yeah. You're talking now about the merits of the case. Correct. Yeah. So let's get to that. Um, I kind of saw the meat of the analysis being what I would characterize as a structural analysis and then a functional analysis. And I explained this more in a Substack post, but, you know, a structural analysis is really looking at the design of the constitution and how it allocates different powers among the branches and the balance and checks, you know, that each branch has over the, over the other to look to see whether Trump's claim makes sense in that design. And so it essentially is like a separation of powers uh, mm. analysis of of how this would work uh, if if he were if he were correct. Yeah, and I, I will say that um, uh, part of what I think they ultimately do is sort of show which his the ways in which his arguments are contrary to sort of the structure of the Constitution, and then ultimately, I'm sure you'll get to this uh, in a moment. Um, the, sort of the language even of the Constitution, particularly of the impeachment clause. Yeah. Well, the I think the structural analysis is really about how how can the executive be constrained by either of the other two branches? You know, in what arenas it are his acts essentially unreviewable? And are what in what in which situations do they, you know, can they come under the auspices of the other branches. And so they make a distinction between they're drawing on kind of the central case that gives judicial review, Marbury versus Madison, to make a distinction between discretionary acts and ministerial acts. Yes. And that was a really important distinction here because they say discretionary acts are things where there's some latitude for the president to act and you know, those can't necessarily, those don't really come under review by the other branches. Um, in my Substack, I thought, of, you know, they didn't use this example, but things that really are exclusive to the office of the presidency, like negotiating with foreign governments or something like that. Right. Um, you know, by the way, you've mentioned your Substack. Where, where can we listen to, Eric? where can we read that just so we're, uh, everyone knows? So you can go to asharangappa.substack.com. And yeah, this one this one was a free post, so you can check it out and you can subscribe if you like. Okay, we'll put a link below. But anyway, so I'm just thank it, you. But but um, but putting that to the side, yeah, I think the point that you're trying to make is there's certain things that the president are sort of exclusively in the presidential domain, and other acts in which the president is acting in conjunction with other branches of government. Right, and. What the court basically says is that criminal laws of general applicability also apply to the president. <laughs> and this seems like it should be obvious, but I think it's really important that they spell that out. In other words, the president still has to act within the bounds that are set by Congress, um, including in, in the criminal laws. And so... When he runs afoul of those laws, then yes, they can be prosecuted and they can come under the jurisdiction of the judicial branch. Um, it, it's kind of just spelling out and they they sum it up later in the case that to accept Trump's claim would basically put him out of the reach of all three branches of government. In other words, Congress wouldn't be able to legislate to... Uh, you know, make anything that he does illegal. Uh, the judicial branch could never have a case uh, brought before them. And even the executive branch wouldn't be able to prosecute him. 
So it just essentially would just make this, you know, a one man kingdom, I guess. Dictatorship, essentially. It's really yeah. the opposite of what the American experiment was supposed to be about. Correct. It seems pretty self evident. And by the way, I think they analogize here to the ways in which members of Congress and even judges can be held criminally accountable. In other words, there are certain things that are outside the scope of the discretion of members of Congress or even judges that if they are unlawful can be sanctioned criminally. And what it made me think of in this context was Senator Menendez, who was literally using his official duties to for for unlawful ends. Right. I mean, he was he was withholding. I mean, he had the power to withhold aid and and whatever. Um, sure. Yeah, but he yeah. was doing it in concert with a foreign government, allegedly. And, um, you know, that that is what made it criminal. Sure. And in the and for example, in my city, there's something called Operation Greylord, where many of the judges, uh, w- local judges, were caught up in bribery scandal. And were prosecuted uh, by by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and ultimately uh, ended up paying the ultimate price for that. Because even if you're a judge and you're you're engaging in your official duties, uh, you can't commit bribes, right? Or engage in bribery, or you know, d- d- you know, break the criminal law that is separate and apart from your duties as a judge. The mere fact that you're a judge doesn't exempt you from the reach of the law. The court's basic point here was: if you analogize to the constraints that are put on the other branches, it would only be logical that the same kind of constraint, the prohibition against violating criminal laws that cabin both of the other branches would also apply to the executive branch, which I thought was really powerful because, you know, through the Mueller investigation, there was this whole sub thread from, you know, very conservative circles about how the president can't obstruct justice because he also takes care that the laws be faithfully executed. And so it's sort of like, completely up to him whether he can start and stop investigations. And to me, this really, not directly, but the theory here undercuts that idea. And they say elsewhere in the opinion that it it would sort of turn the Constitution on his head if the branch that is entrusted with taking care that the laws be faithfully executed could like violate them with impunity. Yeah. I mean, that was, I thought, the most powerful piece of the opinion. Was where they're talking about the take care clause and the fact that the the president of the United States is supposed to be in charge of ensuring that the laws are executed, and yet putting him above the law would be so contrary to that it's it's literally turning this on its head. I mean, some of the most powerful passages in the opinion do that. And I will just say, a lot of our listeners are probably like, "Well, yeah, duh," but I think what's really important about this opinion is the way in which it spells out in detail. The the reasons why what is so obvious to many of us um, is, in fact, the case, right? I mean, don't you think that's part of the power here, Ash, is that it really forces, let's say, the United States Supreme Court, hypothetically, and the justices uh, sitting in that court to really grapple with the arguments um, doesn't give them an easy out uh, on some of the issues that I think would, would otherwise seem pretty obvious to, to a lot of our Yeah, and I think that that's why they're – frame of analysis, the fact that they are looking at, you know, how this would really upend the entire constitutional design um, is what's powerful here. It's not just saying, well, that's a dumb argument or like, obviously, the criminal laws apply to you. It's saying that that would ultimately privilege not even just one branch over the other two branches, but one person over the entire system of government. Um, and I think that that is important to spell out. So then they go to this functional argument. And I would say that that is about the practical and policy effects of Trump's claim. So, you know, how would this affect the actual ability for the government to do its job? And what are the interests that are at stake? Because what Trump was arguing on this front is that if you don't allow absolute immunity, and Trump has basically truthed this, you know, to uh, this idea that you're just going to open the floodgates, that all of a sudden 
former presidents will just start being prosecuted all over the place. And that on top of that, sitting presidents will then not be able to execute their duties because they're going to be afraid of potential criminal liability. In other words, there's going to be a chilling effect on the office of the presidency. So this, the court takes on this claim. Yeah, it's in many ways the claim that is going to be publicly debated and discussed about this for the reason you just said, Asha. It's being pushed out by Trump on social media as the key argument. That's what really is motivating him. It's interesting because throughout all of American history, presidents have operated without an assumption that they're immune, right? They were concerned about, you know, and Richard Nixon was trying to fight uh, an investigation because not necessarily because of impeachment, but he was concerned about a potential prosecution. In fact, he sought, a, sought and obtained a pardon, right? Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, Bill, when Bill Clinton was under investigation, you know, no one, it never, no one on either side ever considered, well, he's completely immune from prosecution for anything, right? Uh, there's no, he could never be prosecuted ever. No one ever considered that. So, you know, um, this is, it's interesting that now suddenly, according to Trump, uh, presidents can't do their job without having this absolute immunity. Right. And the court basically says this. They're like, P.S., every president has been operating under the assumption that there could be criminal liability. So whatever chilling effect there could be by the prospect of criminal prosecution, that's already been in place. And it, it, the fact that Trump is actually being prosecuted doesn't really change that. It's just acting on, you know, it's just taking the understanding that every president has had to its logical conclusion when there's actually a violation of the law. And then on the floodgates argument, the court also says that they think it's unlikely that there'll be this sudden, you know, avalanche of prosecutions because they talk about how the high bar for prosecutors to bring a case, the due process hurdles that they have to go through in terms of having to get an indictment by a grand jury, and that these are all essentially speed bumps um, on the way, and that this is what makes it different than the civil context. Because in the civil context, it's not government officials that are bringing cases. It's literally any person that, you know, can claim some injury. Um, And the prospect of vexatious litigation, I guess, is much higher in the civil context than in the criminal context. Yeah, it's interesting. I will say, Asha, even though I agree with the opinion um, overall, and I think it's very well written, that to me is the the spot in which there's something to what the, the Trump team is arguing in that, you know, uh, given um, how they have try to turn one plus one equal, you know, equaling three here, you know, it's like the the Republicans are so focused on, you know, the quote weaponization of the Justice Department, even though Trump was the one using it to attack his enemies. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the next time the Republicans are in power, they do abuse the Justice Department. I wouldn't su- be surprised if a state or local prosecutor in a red state tries to prosecute, um, you know, the, the Democratic president. I mean, it's sad, but true. Um, I don't think the due process protections um, are sufficient enough to prevent at least an indictment uh, may, might might result in an acquittal, a trial so or or along the way. So I do think there's something to that, but that doesn't I mean, that doesn't outweigh all of the reasons that we've already discussed why you wouldn't want to give a president a complete immunity to break the you know, break criminal laws uh, willy nilly. That's right. And the court actually identifies the interests on the other side that they have to consider, which is, which are not just the separation of powers considerations, but actually policy considerations. And they identify three main ones. Um, so the panel says the first is the public's interest in criminal accountability. Like when people commit crimes, we want to you know, see them held accountable and have a jury decide whether they're guilty or not. And also there's the voters' interest in being able to democratically elect a president. So, you know, that's that's a particular interest at stake in this particular case, which they identify. And the last interest, which I thought was really the most 
important and interesting, not necessarily the most important, but the most in- interesting and insightful, and it's something that came up during the oral argument by Judge Henderson, is the interest of the executive branch in upholding elections and ensuring that the executive power vests in a newly elected president. And to me, this was really powerful because it envisions the executive branch as an institution which is separate than the person occupying it. Um, And I think that is so fundamental because what the court is saying there is not only do we have to consider that interest, but that Trump's interest here was actually in opposition to the institution that he was essentially a steward of. Wow. That's a really profound point. And I'm glad that you highlighted that, Asha. Yeah, that is truly profound because Trump – conflates the two constantly, right? He, you know, he, it's like uh, Louis the Fourteenth, you know, la tête c'est moi, right? Like I am the state, I am the nation. Um, Trump views himself as the government, views himself as the presidency. And that's not the case. The presidency and the executive branch, um, ha, you know, exist separate and apart from Donald Trump himself and have, and really the office of the presidency and the executive branch have separate interests, um, and in the case of January 6th, which is the subject of this indictment, he was acting contrary to the interests of the executive branch, which are that the lawfully and duly elected uh, you know, president-elect should become president of the United States. That's right. And this is really about what's called the vestiture clause of Article 2. And I just want to emphasize that conservatives love the vestiture clause because – Article two says all the executive power shall vest in the president of the United States. And this is sort of like this idea that, you know, this huge ball of power kind of sits there. And if you really believe that, then the idea that someone would thwart the ability for a person, let's be agnostic on who that is, from, you know, taking that mantle seamlessly means that you're essentially supporting this idea that there's this huge vacuum in this major source of power in our government, which would basically make our government ineffective. Right. I mean, I think that it's fair to say that Trump doesn't respect the fact that transferring power um, is a central facet of the presidency. Um, And in fact, that's- And of the executive branch. That's specifically. Right. And that's mm-hmm. precisely what this criminal trial will eventually be about if and when that happens. Yeah. I, I think that was really a, a critical point. I, I'm sure it will be overlooked because it wasn't the sexiest point, but I think that is what the case is about. And it really gets to, it touches on even, I think, some of the issues with his disqualification, maybe not the direct legal argument, but this idea that he was not supporting the Constitution. Yeah, I, I think it's this it's this sort of subtle, subtle point that's hard to explain in a six hundred word article. It's hard to explain in like a ninety second a TV hit or segment, but it's really interesting and important. And it's it's not obvious, but it's the sort of thing that would be very challenging for the Supreme Court to grapple with if they wanted to try to go the other way. Yeah especially since many of them really have strong views about the vesture clause and and the executive power um, under Article 2. So then finally, they get to the impeachment clause arguments. um, And basically, these are there. There's two sub arguments here. One is the SEAL Team 6 (laughs) um, argument, which is that a president can't be held criminally accountable unless he is first impeached and convicted for the same conduct. And then the second argument is that because Trump was impeached, trying him for crimes arising out of the same conduct amounts to double jeopardy. That's right. Now, we talked about both of those arguments before on prior uh, episodes of the podcast, but I think What's important here, and I think 
you know, what they're, what they do is they really, I think it's very powerful. What they're basically pointing out is that Trump not only is trying to read in something into the impeachment clause that isn't there, but actually if you go with Trump here and you side with him and you ruled in his favor, it would actually, um, undercut the impeachment clause, which makes clear that in, that it contemplates the prosecution of a president. If, if in fact, the, the writers and authors of the Constitution didn't contemplate that a president could be prosecuted, it's odd that they would have a clause in the Constitution that would you know, explicitly discuss the future prosecution of a president. Yes. And I thought the historical analysis here was really interesting. The panel talks about how under the crown, impeachment could carry all kinds of really severe criminal consequences. I mean, you know, like kind of, I I think, I don't remember exactly what they were, but I think they could even be jailed and all, all this kind of stuff. So what they were trying to say is knowing this, the framers made clear that impeachment shall, it can, the punishment for impeachment, which is a political mechanism, will can only go as far as taking the person out of office and perhaps disqualifying them from holding office again, but that that will not be a bar to them being tried under a criminal process in which they can they can then have these other types of penalties. And it's just basically a, a logical reading and they they discuss how Trump's reading is really a, rests on a logical fallacy. And by the by, also that their own argument, again, in a, lo- in a logical twist, undercuts their absolute immunity claim. Because if the idea is that you could be prosecuted under some limited set of conditions, then it's not really absolute, is it? Yeah, I thought, like I said, I thought that was actually the best part of the opinion, the most persuasive. And I think it's going to carry the day with some of the conservative justices on the Supreme Court who are textualists and are, and really, you know, want to sit there and grapple with wording in the Constitution. I just think that's a very challenging clause for them to explain away. And I think that the opinion does an excellent job of explaining how if you really take that clause seriously – it 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 certainly means that the Trump that Trump's arguments are not accurate. So you, maybe some hypothetical immunity arguments could be made, but certainly the arguments he's making don't comport with that clause. Right, they're not consistent. Um, my favorite part of that part of the analysis was them citing to Trump's own argument in his impeachment trial, where he claimed that this what it wasn't an impeachable offense, and the, the only thing that he the only remedy was to prosecute him in court. And then quoting Mitch McConnell saying that they couldn't convict Trump of the crimes for which he, the high crimes that he was impeached for because he was no longer president and he was a private citizen. And what they basically said was, if we accept this theory, then there's like this big gap in which either things that aren't, recognized as impeachable offenses or crimes that are discovered after the person leaves office. Like you discover that there's like, you know, 15 dead bodies in the white house basement (laughs) (laughs) can never be prosecuted. And how would that make any sense? And I love that they then drop a footnote and name like 30 other Republican senators who all said the same thing. (laughs) Yeah. And, and uh, you know, when I I had made a similar point in television, it was pointed out to me that, well, you know, McConnell's somewhat disingenuous, right? He's not somebody we could take at face value. But the point stands. I mean, the point is. On the record. Right. I mean, the point is just that having, we're in the situation where essentially they're trying, it's like a gotcha game. At the time, they're like, well, you could prosecute us. And now that he hasn't been impeached, it's like, okay, well, now you can't, you can't prosecute us. It's it's just, it's, um, it's 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 trying to have their cake and eat it too, and it's a way of holding him above the law. So I think it's a good argument. It's one yeah. that definitely we saw coming right from that oral argument earlier. Yeah. So then the last piece is this whole double jeopardy thing, which I think they dispense with pretty easily by just explaining that the prohibition on 
double jeopardy is that you can't be put in double put in jeopardy of life or limb you know for the same conduct and that because impeachment is a political punishment not a criminal one it doesn't raise that concern and i felt like they could have just ended it there because to me that's an obvious distinction they then go on to do this analysis this double jeopardy analysis where they say right. you know and even if it was like what he's being prosecuted for are different crimes than what he was impeached for. And to me, this was the part where I cringed because I feel like in the in the off chance, it's not even an off chance, in the chance that the Supreme Court decides that the 14th Amendment disqualification clause isn't self-executing and needs something else, like a criminal conviction, I think this reasoning then makes it hard that even if he's convicted for the all these January 6th crimes, that it doesn't meet the bar for disqualification because, quote, they're not the same. They're, they're not the same crime as insurrection. I think that's that's fa- that's right. Uh, I, I think, look, I, I've <laughs> we've I discussed like, Shut this. Up. Pre- end here. End here. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, as I've said elsewhere, I mean, I, I think there's going to be an uphill battle on the for, on the 14th Amendment argument in the Supreme Court. But I think here, this – what you just talked about, it's actually – it's like a block burger analysis. You know, typically double jeopardy arguments are almost impossible to make. So, you know, whereas like if I commit fraud and I'm prosecuted for wire fraud and I beat – you know, and then I beat the charges somehow or they're dismissed and then they prosecute me for mail fraud, the same activity, same conduct, same everything. It's just that I – the jurisdictional hook is different. That's enough uh, under this analysis. It's very weak level of – protection that you have in, under a double jeopardy analysis. And so, you know, but I think it's, it's, and I think partly the point they were trying to make there is, okay, if we want, you know, if we're going to actually take this argument seriously, he loses anyway. Mm-hmm. It's a sort of belt and suspenders approach that I thought was a strength of this opinion. Okay. So I'll, I'm just approaching it just purely from this, the looking at it from this opinion in this case, I thought it was a strength because what they're trying to do is make it as difficult as possible for the United States Supreme Court to take this and come to a contrary result. And I think they accomplished that. But that you're right. It's a weak argument, the double jeopardy argument, but it's never been made before. It's an issue of first impression. It's super important uh, case. So I I don't fault them for making the argument. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that even if Jack Smith had charged Trump with Rebellion and insurrection, the exact same thing that he was impeached for. I still think it would have failed the double jeopardy argument. For the for your first point, the first argument, yeah. right? But like I said, it's a belt and suspenders approach. Um, you know, it's it's trying what the court is trying to do here is be super comprehensive. I mean, if I was writing a judicial opinion, it's just which is perhaps why I'm not in the DC Circuit Court. One of many reasons why I'm not in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. I would have probably written a 14 I, – I, mine could have been like 14 pages, not 57. You know what I mean? There's not – a lot of this stuff you could just do, deal with with the back of the hand, right? Yeah. You or I might write two paragraphs dismissing this double jeopardy thing. Like, come on. You know, double jeopardy applies to criminal convictions. You know, impeachment's a political, um, a political remedy. has nothing to do with it. Bye. But that's not what they're doing here. You know, they were being very careful and very comprehensive and trying to make it as difficult as possible – uh, for this to be overturned. And I, I think they were doing what they should be doing as judges, which is to be very careful, very considered. They understood the weight of history on this. This would, for, all, for these three judges, this would likely be the most important opinion they'll ever write in their career, no matter, even if they get elevated as the Supreme Court, it very well might be. And so uh, I think um, they, they took it seriously and they didn't want to leave anything on the table. And I can't really fault them for that. So where are we now? Trump can appeal. Yep. So Trump's going to – so the, the first issue is will this be stayed while Trump is trying to seek cert at the Supreme Court? That's like the first question. If the Supreme Court does not stay um, this while uh, they're considering whether to take cert, that's that's a really – bad sign for Trump because things start moving and it signals that the court's not likely going to take the case. If they do stay this, 
then they still will have their internal discussion and debate about whether to take it. Um, and, and it'll be interesting because so for the petition for writ of certiori, which is essentially the, the United States Supreme Court deciding whether they want to take this up, there only four justices need to vote um, affirmatively to take the case. But I believe for the state, you need five judges, That's five right. justices, right? So that'll be you know a, an interesting tell there as well. Um, but reg- regardless, I don't really think that four justices are going to take this up unless they think they have a very clear and solid majority to roll back um, significantly the D.C. Circuit's reasoning. And you have to wonder, from my perspective, the reason I've been saying, and I think I said this month, like weeks ago when we were talking about the oral argument, that I really thought there's a good chance the Supreme Court just would let the D.C. Circuit's opinion stand here, is because let's just say that you're a justice, you're you know Justice Kavanaugh, and you're you're like, well – I don't agree with a third of the things that are said by the D.C. Circuit, but I'm not going to rule in Trump's favor on everything. Why vote to take this up and have this opinion that it has no impact, but just pisses a lot of people off and just let the D.C. Circuit do whatever and just, you know, wash your hands of it? Yeah. And all of those, the different flowchart decisions there will affect the timing of when this actually goes to trial, because as we discussed in this podcast a couple weeks ago, everything is paused until this particular issue is resolved with some finality. That's right. I think the real danger for Jack Smith's team is if the Supreme Court takes this case and there's oral arguments and then there's a Supreme Court decision, that could very well put this late enough where you couldn't have the trial realistically before the election without ha- you know, if you're going to give Trump's team time to prepare. That's the concern. Otherwise, like if if the court considers taking and it doesn't, uh, even if they allow the case to be stayed for some period of time while they're they're considering that, I don't think that that's going to be enough delay for Trump to get it past the election. We'll be on the edge of our seats as we wait. So, Asha, do you have anything special planned for Valentine's Day? Yes, I do. I I love Valentine's Day. You can see I'm wearing pink already. Um, I think it's a fun holiday. I generally don't like going out because it's such a zoo, but I like planning and doing something special. Yeah, I'm a big Valentine's Day person too. Uh, If you go to dinner, you always end up getting kind of taken over the coals, right? There's these like special prefix menus and so on. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, if we're going to do anything super fancy, uh, but we'll, we're going to go out and have a nice dinner. And then I do have a present for my wife, but I'm not sure if I'm going to reveal too many details because she actually listens to the podcast. And so it's going to ruin the surprise, which is no problem. Oh. Well, my boyfriend doesn't listen to the podcast, so I can, <laughs> so I can talk about his present. Um, so for the last few years, I have gotten in the tradition of making a year in review photo book. You know, so through cool. Shutterfly, I just, you know, compile all of our photos and have fun captions to capture it all. Uh, and I find that Valentine's Day is a better holiday to give this than Christmas, A, because I have a little more time. And also you can capture all the photos, you know, through the holidays to include in it. So it's a whole year. So I did that. Um, And then I am planning on making dinner. And yeah, and then otherwise, I, I got him a pink tie that has like blue flowers on it. Yeah. Wow. All right. Bold. Yeah, I know. That's I clear I, I cleared with him casually a few weeks ago whether he would wear a pink tie and he said, "Yeah, sure." So, wow. That's my wife's favorite mm-hmm. color. I don't know. I have had pink ties in the past, but not my favorite color. I actually try to go tie less. We can talk about that sometime. I just uh, have to say, I love it when men wear pink. Yeah, you it's do. hot. Wow. I actually wore pink in my high school graduation photo, I think. True story. Um, but I have not been a big pink person ever since. Like pink um, ties. More, I like like light blue. Pink ties, pink polo shirts, pink light pink button down, you know, 
I think those are, I, I find them, I, I think they reflect a lot about the man that he's comfortable. That's interesting. I tend to wear the same clothes. You know how like people, you read these things, like people wear the same clothes. I wear a lot of the same clothes all the time and just keeping it very simple. And I always wear light blue dress shirts all the time. That's my suits. If you want, look at a photo of me, I almost always have like, yeah, blue. it's just something I say. I, it's my favorite color is blue. So I just standardized on that. A lot. So what's your general category of Valentine gift? So it involves Henry because oh. my wife is like obsessed with our mm -hmm. dog, like absolutely obsessed with the dog. I'm like very much second fiddle uh, in that regard. So I, I realize that if we're talking about love, it's got to involve a pet, but I don't want to give too much specifics because it's like one of those gifts that like, I can't describe it without giving away. Okay. So That's yeah. Nice. So, but, so you're not a chocolates or flowers or jewelry person. I married somebody who does not like chocolate. True story. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's not a chocolate person. I have gi given her, she would love jewelry. I've given her a bunch of, you know, she's got jewelry, but that would be a very appropriate gift. Mm -hmm. Flowers might, uh, might make an appearance. That's good. That's a good call. Actually, it's a good reminder. Yeah. Like, the flowers. I love flowers and I don't get them enough. I'm just going to say that since noted. my does, boyfriend is a lead to this like podcast, flowers? but if he does now he can know. <laughs> Yeah, message message received. Yeah. M S W Media.